Today on Lawyers with Game, we're talking with Chris Perna about his lifelong love of horror and his work on classic video games like Gears of War and Fortnite. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lawyers with Game. I'm your host, Darius Gambino. I'm an intellectual property attorney with over 20 years of experience advising clients on issues related to patents, trademarks, and copyrights. I'm also a lifelong gamer, having played on about every system from the original Atari to now the PlayStation 5. You can find me on the PlayStation Network as EaglesFan71. I'm really excited to have as my guest today, Chris Perna. Chris worked as a digital artist and an art director at Epic Games for over 20 years, and he worked on franchises like Gears of War, Infinity Blade, and Fortnite. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Darius. Good to be here. It's great to have you. So I wanted to jump right into it and talk about your path to your current role, which is uh, running your own company and producing your own content. Your company's called Black Obelisk. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you start out uh, in digital artistry um, uh, and start working at Epic Games? And, and how did you uh, wind up where you are today? Well, you know, I started really young. I was, I was, you know, drawing when I was like 18 months old. Like my parents were amazed at, at uh, what I was coming up with. <laughs> um, and at the time, you know, it was like early 70s, I guess. And it was... Uh, there were programs on TV that really influenced me. There was like this Sid and Marty Croft had shows like HR Puff and stuff and, and things like that. So I was drawing witches and, and all kinds of dragons and stuff all over everything by the time I was like two or three. Um, so uh, that just continued uh, through high school. I also had kind of a, I guess, an ADHD anxiety disorder, undiagnosed at the time, right? But I just could not sit still in class. And when that door shut, it was terrifying for me. I was like, well, what if I have to go to the bathroom? What if I do this or that? Um, so I, what I did was I withdrew and, and literally I would draw in class um, and I would draw monsters and kind of, you know, all my anxiety would kind of come out on the page. And um, that was, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get into movies early on, <clears throat> you know, in high school through my drawing, I, I collected Fangora magazines and, um, star log and, and things like that. And I was fascinated with, um, you know, sci-fi and horror and, and all of that stuff. And I, I guess it was because of my kind of anxious background. I had trouble sleeping and, you know, all that stuff, anything that made you afraid I was interested in. Um, so I was, you know, constantly trying to conquer my fears, I guess, and draw them out and, and, uh, you know, have these, these kind of things. So anyway, um, I had, you know, at that time I was like in high school and, I, you know, by the time I got to high school, I had a whole portfolio of monster stuff and barbarians and, you know, all this stuff. My, my influential artists were uh, Frank Frazetta was my number one. Um, and then there were a host of others. H.R. Giger at the time had come out with Alien and, you know, all these fantastic movies and artists were creating content that I was just immersing myself in. I graduated from FIT with an advertising degree, an associate degree in advertising. And I, I got a job setting type at the Smithtown News. On, on, it was a newspaper on Long Island. I, I was uh, setting real estate ads, real estate classified ads. And that was, that was great. On like a Mac 2 classic, right? It was a little tiny box computer. Um, but I learned, I learned programs, Quark Express, graphic design, I, all that stuff. And eventually I worked my way up to... Um, uh, an award-winning ad agency on Long Island, Denaudi Munch. Um, and, you know, we won many, many best on Long Island awards uh, for creativity. Um, they were a great shop. I, I learned a lot there. I became an art director there. And I, I did that for about eight years. But my passion was still horror. <clears throat> my passion was still monsters. I still read Fangora religiously, and, and I loved watching horror movies. And, and I still had this burning desire to scare people. Um, so uh, one day I'm in, I'm in the office and I hear one of the account executives playing a game, a video game. And uh, I go in there and I look and I see what he's playing and it's, it's Doom. I had never seen anything like it. It blew my mind. Um, it, was, it was gore, it was monsters, it was fast paced, frenetic. It, it, you know, it was just amazing. Um, 
So I didn't have a system at home or anything. So my brother and I uh, went out and we bought a Sega Genesis 32X. It was the, the cheapest thing we could buy to play Doom on. Um, and then we just played the crap out of Doom. We just played it 24 seven for, for months. So what, what, after Doom, um, let me backtrack a little bit. After Doom, it was working on Quake. Um, and I, I would work in advertising during the day, probably, you know, 12, 13 hours a day. It was, it was pretty long hours, but I'd go home and I, I bought a PC. I saved up enough to get a Pentium 75 with a voodoo four megabyte card. And I would mod Quake at night and I'd mod to like three in the morning. Um, and it was, uh, <laughs> it was amazing. I was doing textures. I was modeling characters. I was building levels. I learned all the software that, that um, you know, they, they were using to make the game. Um, and then I found out that John Romero was leaving its software and forming this company called Ion Storm in Dallas. Um, I, I, I just got married uh, to my wife. So I, I said, do you want to do this? And she said, well, do you want to do this? <laughs> I said, yeah, hell yeah. Um, so we did it and um, we went to Dallas and I did that for about three years. I worked seven days a week, 16 hours a day on, on a game called Daikatana. So I did that for about three years. Ion Storm burned through their money. They had one hit game, uh, Deus Ex, uh, which Warren Spector put out. Um, and then uh, Daikatana came out and it was, it had just taken too long and there was too much uh, controversy around the game and it just got critically panned and then the fans didn't like it. It was very buggy when it came out. Um, and uh, I think it was, um, I, don't, I don't know if it was so deserved that the, uh, the, the, the backlash that it got. As Iron Storm was imploding, we were working with uh, Unreal Technology. Uh, John Romero had gotten a hold of um, some, uh, I guess it was Unreal Warfare engine at the time. Um, and that was from Tim Sweeney. And we were, we were working on something called Game X, um, which was, was pretty cool. It had some monsters and stuff. And I, I liked it, but <clears throat> Epic contacted me and said, hey, do you have anything you could show us? And I, so I started to send them stuff to a guy named Cliff Blazinski. Um, I, I, and, and he put me through the, he put me through the ringer. <laughs> he, he made me model characters and do animation walk cycles. And, you know, I was, I was kind of a lead artist. Um, I knew how to texture and make levels and, 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 you know, basically light things and make stuff look good, but I didn't really know how to model or, um, or animate. So I, I was like trial by fire. I just, I just wanted to ask you, was yeah. Epic working on uh, Gears of War at that time, or was this before yeah. Gears of War? It was before Gears of War. Epic was working on something called Unreal Warfare. They, they were wrapping up Unreal Tournament. They were trying to expand on that, I think, and Battlefield that just came out. I think they were working on a game called, uh, or, or a project called Unreal Warfare. It was kind of a, a massive battlefield with two teams, and it was order versus chaos, and, and it's eventually what Gears of War became. But... Um, not not at that time. So we were working with that technology and John had wanted to do this kind of space, uh, kind of uh, scary space game. Um, so we were working on that with him. And then I, I you know, went through the, the dog and pony show with Cliff. And then I flew out there. I met everybody in the company. I think there were 16 people at the time or, or 15. I was number 16. And uh, I met with every single person that day and, and alone. Um, somebody drove me to lunch, somebody drove me back, th this type of thing. And I, I guess I had to fit. I had to pass the, the personality test as well as the talent. So um, I did. And then Mark Rain called me that night and said, hey, you got the job. Here's, here's your bonus. Here's what you're starting at. And it was, it was great. <laughs> and, and, you know, I love him ever since. Were you the lead um, uh, on uh, Gears of War as your first project there? Or was, were there other projects? I was an art lead on Gears of War. Jerry O'Flaherty was the art director. So I, Jerry is the guy who hired me at Ion Storm. So this is a, a weird story. So when, when I got to Epic, we were doing Unreal Tournament. Um, and then it was Unreal Warfare. And then, and then there was like an Unreal Tournament port to PS2 and, and stuff like that. But the Unreal Warfare stuff started to morph into Gears of War. And as we were, as we were going along with that, I think they, they felt like they needed more more structure in the company. So they hired a company, they, they hired a guy named Mike Caps to start a company called Scion Studios. And that was in-house at Epic. And they were making a game called Unreal Championship. Um, and Mike needed an art director. And I said, look, I worked with Jerry over at Ion Storm. I said, he's amazing. 
you know. And at the time, I thought I was going to be the art director at Epic. Um, it was just it just felt natural that I would just step up into that role. So I was like, okay, look, hire Jerry. He's awesome. So they Mike hired Jerry, and then unbeknownst to me, they they merged. Um, Ion Storm, uh, not Scion Studios, and Epic merged and became one company. And Mike Caps became the president of Epic. Jerry became the art director at Epic. Um, so that was that was a surprise to me. And, and Jerry and I had a rough start, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, right off the bat because of that. He was your boss at that point, right? I yeah, mean, but he was my yeah. boss. Yeah, he was my boss at Ion Storm too, and he was one of the owners as well. Um, so I, I respected him. He was a great art director. Um, he was, he's actually a really great guy. Um, it was just early on, there was a misunderstanding and, and I was like, Hey, you know, I, this is my position. What are you doing? I've been working on this game for months and, and you came in and now you want to change all the designs and do all this stuff. So anyway, it was all for yeah. the best, but you know, he, he had yelled, he yelled at me one day in the, in the, in the room and, and, you know, I don't know if I was going to kill him or start crying. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so we, I mean, not all that. It was great. Um, let's 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 talk about uh, let's talk about Gears of War a little bit, like the process that you went through there. I mean, I'm assuming you designed kind of all the characters and all the environments and all those things from the ground up, since there were only 16 or so people at Epic at that time. Yeah, what but we, when we were deep into the production of Gears of War, there was more. There was a, okay. a few more people. We, we we hired somebody from Microsoft. This guy, an awesome guy named Rod Ferguson. He became the producer. Um, and then they started to hire people for, for a lot of these positions. So we quickly grew, um, because there was a need, uh, but I, you know, Gears of War was, um, that was like a labor of love, right? That was, holy shit, we're doing monsters and, 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 uh, you know, we're doing monsters, we're doing, uh, weapons and shooting and, and, you know, big dudes and, and, uh, awesome space war stuff and it was it was just so cool it was like everything we've always wanted to do um we had there was a like nice click of artists that were very like-minded there that just wanted to do this kind of stuff so um including me so that, that was fun um so we kind of set on that journey um and uh, you know that's the rest is history i guess um so well you mentioned hr uh geiger and and um for Zeta before. So like what, what were some of your influences in developing the Gears of War world? Cause it does have some of those Geiger elements of, of the alien world. And it does have, you know, some of these muscle bound, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, guys that are, that are reminiscent of, of for Zeta's, you know, work yeah. with uh, characters like Conan and things like that. Yeah. So were so those your main influences? Yeah. yeah, it was all it, mostly for Zeta. I mean, it was all for Zeta. Warhammer had a big influence on us. Uh, Lord of the Rings had a big influence on us. Um, it was it was orcs with guns, basically. You know, um, it was just uh, you know, as a lead artist, I got to design and concept all these wild creatures and, and stuff, which was that was a dream come true. Um, the, the weapons and and you know, working with really talented people to come up with these things. And at the time, we were like five years ahead of anybody. The the technology was really cutting edge. Um, the, the lighting model and, and what we were doing with the Unreal Engine at that time, nobody had seen it before. And, and in fact, um, I, we, you know, Microsoft was going to go with like, like a 256 megabyte chip, I think, for their Xbox 360. Um, and, and because we were doing Gears of War, because it looked so good, I was tasked with kind of creating a demo that said, hey, here's what you get if you go with 256 memory, and, and here's what you get if you go with 512. And the 512 sold them on on the fact that um, they would get so much more out of it. And I think it became a loss leader. I think it was, I think they lost money on the consoles because of it, but it was worth it because they, they picked up on the software, I think, and, and they won that console generation. Um, that was an amazing box and, and, you know, they had amazing games for it. Yeah, certainly from my perspective, I think they won that that console war. The you know the original Xbox and then the 360 yeah. were unbelievably powerful machines when you compared them to you know the N64, the GameCube, or the PS1 or things like that. So yes, um, yes. So uh, let me ask you about some of the other games you worked on at Epic. Um, I mean, you obviously spent a lot of your time on Gears of War. Um, uh, Gears of War 1, you were a uh, lead artist. I think you were art director yeah. on Gears of War 2 and 3. Yes. 
Um, I know you worked a little bit on Fortnite in the latter stages of your career there. Um, what were some of the other uh, big games that you worked on? We did Gears of War and Gears of War 2 and 3. Uh, we did Judgment. By, by the time Judgment came around, I was the studio art director. I was My title was director of Art Worldwide Studio. So I, I was touching everything at like a, you know, 20,000 foot level. Um, and I had a lot of art directors that reported to me and a lot of lead artists and stuff. And, and uh, it was it was great. It was a really good time to be there and be in the industry. Um, I think after Gears, uh, Fortnite was been in, was in development for a long time. It didn't hit right after Gears, but, um, it, you know, uh, we had, I think after Gears of War, we were doing this, this a couple couple games that never saw the light of day. Um, there was some code name Nano game that we had done um, that was kind of a prototype. We just kind of went into product to prototype with that stuff. Um, we did we did Infinity Blade. We started we wanted to make inroads on the phones and the phone systems and stuff. And we had Chair Entertainment and um, the Mustard Brothers and, and those guys are all those guys are amazing. Um, the studio is amazing. Uh, Adam Ford was the art director at the time, I think. Um, and they had done, you know, we, we worked with them to do Infinity Blade and, and that was a really big hit on the iPhones. Um, and it, it taught us a lot about iPhone technology and how to make the engine work on an iPhone and how to optimize our games better and all that. Um, after that, um, I'm sure that I'm forgetting a, a bunch of small things, but, um, you know, Unreal Engine is actually a product as well that I've worked on. And, and so in between games, we're, we're working to make the engine more robust and, and better. And, and so there's that as well. Um, but then there was a game called Paragon that, that we worked on that was pretty exciting. The art in that was really ambitious. Um, I think uh, the gameplay was really ambitious. It was a MOBA, um, but it was it was kind of an action, like a 3D action hybrid MOBA. Um, and I, I don't know that they got it. I don't know that it was the, the fun was there. The art was definitely there. I think the business model was might have been lacking a little bit because it was so expensive to make characters. And then they kind of gave them away for free. And we just couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, that's why Fortnite kind of hit the sweet spot with, with this more stylized content. Um, Paragon was very, very, um, it wasn't realistic. It was kind of hyper realistic. Um, so it's still a lot of stylization, but um, it, you know, it took a lot to get those characters. I think it was per character. It was like four man months or something like that. It was, it was, it was a lot. Um, and when and Port, Fortnite is, I, I just want, don't want to interrupt you, but Fortnite yeah. is a very different art style than Gears of War, and you know, maybe yeah. some of the other things that I think you were involved with prior to that. Were you involved with selecting that kind of that the style of that game when it was in development? <laughs> yeah, in a roundabout way. So Fortnite, when I, when when we went to do Fortnite, I was pushing for a more realistic kind of uh, zombie kind of night. Zombies come at night game, right? You build your fort during the day, and then at night the, the zombies come, and then more realistic, a little scary, um, more cosmic horror maybe, um, and things like that. But rightfully so, they they were like, look, it's a niche market. Um, I, I, they they instinctively knew that they had to be more generic and, and uh, you know, more acceptable to a wider audience and a younger audience. So they, they kind of, uh, an artist named Pete Ellis came up with some, some really cool looking textural stuff that set the style for uh, basically what Fortnite is today. Um, so it was, it was, uh, he did some kind of manipulations on textures that kind of dumbed them down into cartoon, cartoon land, which was, Right. It was very effective and it, and it worked really well. So that's kind of that's kind of what we did. And we, we I recognized it and I was like, look, this, this looks really good. And so we kind of developed it a little more. Um, I definitely had a hand in some of that, had a hand in the character development. Um, and then and then we we kind of went from there. And then, you know, it, it wasn't my jam, really. So over time, you know, as the studio art director, I, I just kind of got busy with other things and Fortnite was developing it on its own. And um, I was involved with more like forward rendering technologies and, and things like that. that. That's really what interested me. Um, and I would always try to, to run like a, a dark horror bend through it all. I remember I had done some stuff for uh, VR, uh, for the VR headset um, for Oculus. And it was a little horror demo. And I had Tim Sweeney come in. I had Joe Babcock come in, who was the CFO. I had a bunch of people come in. And um, 
Dana Cowley, who was the, <laughs> the head of marketing, came in and she uh, she put the headphones on. She watched the demo and she screamed and ripped it off. And at that point, she was like, look, we can't <laughs> we can't go to a trade show and have people running around screaming, ripping the headphones off, you know, so um, Pern is hard. a little too scary. Yeah, Perna's bar demo was no more. So that, that was it, you know. Um, and they, they decided not to do stuff like that. You know, it it's a great vehicle for that kind of horror fun house thing. But again, very niche. And, and you know, instinctively, they were like, no, we need mass market. So mass market content and all that stuff. This is kind of a an ongoing theme with me, right? And it's, it's one of the reasons I eventually left, um, uh, you know, besides just being, being older and not being able to handle the... <laughs> the you know just the the day-to-day -day crazy yeah the corporate world. environment yeah 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 I, just had this, I, yeah I just had this this burning desire to, you know since i was a kid to just do horror stuff and then i'll find any any technology and any any way to try to do it so well we'll talk about that more in a little bit i, I we like to talk about ga uh, you know gaming on on the podcast and uh, i wanted to ask you um, if you're playing any any games right now, um, and uh, what are some of your favorite games of all time? So right now I'm playing Diablo 4. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah, me too. I'm not too far into it, but I, I love... So my all-time favorite game is Diablo 2. Um, and you know, they came out with Diablo 3, and I wasn't crazy about it because it wasn't as dark as 2 and, and stuff. Uh, but, you know, Diablo 2, I just have such great memories of, of I'd like candles and sit alone in, the, in my, my dark dungeon and, and, you know, dungeon crawl like all night. It, it was amazing. Um, so that was that's definitely my favorite game ever. Um, and Quake 1 is probably my second favorite game. And then and then Doom is probably my third favorite game. Um, so all those. Yeah. All those games bring back not only they just bring back really good memories. Um and the the you know the mod community and and the um, the accessibility to the technology, I really I really liked. Um, I really enjoyed all that stuff. Um, so now Diablo Four is out. I think they before Diablo Four they they had done a reboot of Diablo Two with better graphics and it was amazing. So I, I wound up playing that. Yeah, yeah. So I wound up playing that right up until Diablo Four shipped, and uh, now I'm into Four. And it's it's great. I, I love it. It's, it's yeah. Fun. I hadn't I hadn't picked it up in a really long time, and then I got you know I probably hadn't played like you said since two, um, mm -hmm. and then you know this one just looked so amazing and so deep in terms of all the different things that that you can do with it. Yeah. Totally. Um, and and I definitely have gotten really into it. Um, you know, over the past couple of months, we you and I might share that um, fascination with death because I I picked the necromancer as. Uh, uh, as, as my character. So, uh, but it, yeah, I've been having a really good time with that one. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's really fun. Um, um that, that's, that's Rod Ferguson as well. He, he runs that. I think he runs that studio. Um, he, he's, he's, the, he's, the, he was the producer on Gears of War. So he's over at the, uh, Blizzard now. He went to the coalition and he did work with them and then he went over to Blizzard. Yeah, it's an amazing achievement in terms of in terms of the scope of it and the graphics. Oh, and just the, to ship you know, a game like that, I can't even imagine. Yeah. It's, it's right, amazing. right. Yeah. Well, I sit there sometimes and think about that. Like, why with a lot of different games? Like, when you have a really cool platform, why wouldn't you then kind of expand it into properties that you know people like? Like, could you could you at, at some point or another maybe base one of my favorite properties, the X Men? Could you mm -hmm. maybe base, you know, an X-Men franchise in that Diablo type world where you pick a character and kind of move forward through different scenarios? Um, and, you know, so I, I think it has a lot of opportunity to expand if they wanted to ever do something like that. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I totally think so. I mean, look what Fortnite's done. Fortnite's got everything, right? I mean, right. It, uh, yeah. It's Star Wars, Marvel, uh, every movie that's ever John Wick is in there. I mean, it's just it's amazing. Um and, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's. Um, uh, I think I think you have to hit that that cultural zeitgeist, right? You have to hit that moment where you're you're part of pop culture, and then and then it's easy to slide those those things in, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you now a little bit about your current project, which is uh, the feature film you're working on, which is I think uh, I'm characterizing it correctly as a psychological horror film set in the 70s uh that's yeah. called simply 77 um yeah. 
I know, I know you've been filming that and you've been editing it. Um, and that's been a labor of love for you for a while now. What can you tell us about the film? Um, uh, who's working on it with you and, and when we might be able to see uh, a trailer or, or something for it? So this is kind of a lifelong dream of mine to, to do a horror movie. Um, now, 77 is a short film. Uh, I wanted to get my feet wet as a director. Um, I realized that I'm, I'm switching genres. I'm, it's a new role for me. There's a lot I don't know. Uh, making movies is very complex. Um, it's, it's a lot with the actor stuff. I, I have the technology down, I think. You know, I, I know the cameras and I have the film and the lenses and all that stuff. Um, but it's working with the actors that's kind of um, been, a, been a real challenge for me. And, and it's, it's really, um, it's exciting in, in, a, in, a diff, in, a, in a challenging way, right? It's, I'm not like, oh, it's a bummer, it's so challenging. You know, it's, it's a super exciting challenge. And, and you're working with other people that are very passionate about what they do. Um, and it's, it's, it's just really been a great experience, the whole, the whole thing. And I have the bug and I'm going to do more. Um, over, over the years, I've, I've been working on a feature. Uh, so I have a, a script for that that's, that's kind of first pass or second pass now um and 77 is uh the proving ground for this i'm right so i have the feature in the bag i wanted to prove that i could do first of all direct um and then the 77 is set in the same time period same universe as my feature film so this is kind of a visual prototype for the feature so uh can i nail the actor's looks can i nail the costume design can i nail the atmosphere of that i remember of the 70s and that, that i've seen for movies like taxi driver and you know um the warriors and and stuff like that right uh can i can i nail the tension of of and and the the minimalist horror of like a rosemary's baby right i mean these are all great fantastic movies um, and th th that's kind of the bar, right? That's, that's what I want. I don't want to make slashers or gross out movies or anything like that. I want to make these slow, dreadful, um, throwbacks to the seventies. You know, they were, there were no happy endings in the seventies. There was none, none of this, you know, none of this joy and, and all this stuff. It was all, uh, you know, it was all dread. And then, you know, the movies would end just like on a freeze frame of someone's face or a blurry shot of someone's face. And then it would just cut out and the credits would roll. Um, so th that to me was really scary and really awesome. And then uh, we'll see. I I'm excited about it. You know, we, we just wrapped shooting um, in Brooklyn. I was up there. Uh, we, we, of course, we did kind of non-union. Um, the strike's going on and that's, that's horrible for them. So, um, you know, to be pretty respectful and, 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 you know, not make a big noise about, you know, not make a crazy, crazy big noise about it now, I guess. Um, so anyway, rap shooting, I'm, I'm working with a guy named, uh, I'm working with a guy named Jonathan Craven. So uh, Jonathan is Wes Craven's son. Wes Craven did uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. He did, um, you know, Scream, uh, Last House on the Left, Hills Have Eyes. He's an icon of horror. And, and his son, Jonathan, worked on a few of those with him and um, produced a couple of his own and then uh, had a pretty stellar um, uh, creative shop in, in L.A., uh, advertising shop, and the way they did music videos and, and things like that. So Jonathan's very versed in, in film production and, and uh, horror movie pedigree and, and, and things like that. So um, he's just been an amazing talent to work with. Uh, I had him on set. Uh, and he was a, an unbelievable resource for me. Um, so it, it's, it, I'm just having a great time. I mean, it's just a, a really great experience. Um, so the hope is that I can, I can nail this thing. This, I can nail down 77 and it actually uh, excites people. I think it's got a pretty good look. You know, we shot on film, we shot on 35 millimeter. We use Panavision cameras uh, and lenses, all the old school stuff. It's got a, a real cool 70s vibe. Um, and it's scary. I think it's, I think it builds tension. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a creepy little story, uh, that's just kind of been rattling around the back of my mind for years. So, um, the, the hope is that we can take this now and use it as a vehicle to, to get the, you know, the feature, uh, funded. So we'll see. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with you that, I mean, I grew up, you know, watching those movies in the seventies as well. And I always found them to be a lot scarier than what's happening today with the slasher movies. Um, 
for instance, like Salem's Lot was a movie that always scared me. And I'm not sure why. Um, but but, you know, there was just something yeah. about, you know, the, the dark tone of some of those films that was really um, scary in in a in a way that you didn't necessarily know why. Yeah. Um, part, of it, part of it is minimalist. Right. So there, there was a, a thing that came out recently called Skin and Marink. And it, it's a horror movie and it's very minimal. It's like liminal horror. And um, it, it, it really plays on your imagination to create the fear. And I think a lot of the old school movies where Skin and Rink is kind of the extreme, right? I, I, you know, I, I watched it. It was, it was pretty creepy on the edge of my seat. But uh, when I, on a second viewing and a third viewing, it wasn't as effective, right? Once you know the kind of gags, it, it's not as effective. Um, but it's that minimalist horror that, that I think gets to people, the, 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 the door in the hallway that's slightly cracked and the camera tracking to it, right? It's, it's yeah. like, what is that? It allows your imagination to go wild. And that's what I like. That's the kind of horror that I want to create is, is the stuff that it's more about what you don't see than what you see. Um, Hereditary was, was pretty good at that. Um, Ari Aster is a fantastic director. Um, and Hereditary was just filled with dread and, and, and gloom. And it was a little slow, but, but still, it, it, it had that dreadfulness to it. Rosemary's Baby, same thing. Um, yeah. The original Alien, oh my God, you know, just amazing. Um, so it's, it's that type of thing that I'd like to capture um, in what I'm doing now. I, I think we've got a pretty good handle on it. It's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's been, you know, it's been a, 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 an educational process. Um, the post-production is, is really where the movie gets made. Um, you know, coming from a, a gaming and a CG background, I'm not a CG fan in movies at all. Um, for, you know, I think some of the, some of those movies, like the, the action CG stuff, like a lot of the Marvel movies and stuff, they're great, but they, they all kind of blend together at some of the effects, they just get so overwhelmed with effects that I feel like you, you yeah. sometimes lose track of the story, you know? Um, and that's and what got lost with, I think that's what got lost with the star Wars, you know, when, yeah, uh, movies, yeah. when, when Lucas, you know, tried to redo them. I mean, I think some, a large part of their appeal was kind of the way that they were shot using real objects and, yes. you know, um, all the, all the types of technology that they had available at the time. So, yeah. yeah. And the, and the focus on the story, I, I think, with, with all this amazing technology, and it is amazing, but the focus then becomes on that. Like, look at my sick effect, or look at my, look at this, like crazy creature that I did that's all CG. Um, but it looks CG, you know, and, and that's that's yeah. my whole thing. Um, and, and when horror does that, when when these horror movies use stuff like that, that's that turns me off. I, I'm not crazy about that at all. I wish they'd go back to practical. That's, that's um, I know it's more expensive and this and that, but, uh, it's yeah is it really i i I don't know well you've given me a lot of great ideas um i gotta tell you that our friends throw a halloween party every year um and this year the theme that they've picked is classic horror and so i've been kind of ruminating on some of the different things that that i could do for that and you've given me a lot of uh, good things to think about in terms of some of those classic 70s movies um I wanted to ask you um, uh, last, uh, you know, about about what's what's going on in the future. Um, you, you've got a fantastic uh, Instagram page where you post a lot of your artwork. Uh, I know you've you've got your hands in a couple other different things besides the films. Uh, what's what's in the future for you and Black Obelisk? Well, I'd like I'd like to create a place where where like minded people can create um, can create uh, uh, you know be creative. I'd love for Black Obelisk to become like a beacon for those type of people and, and publish novels, uh, movies, short films, um, you know, just an all encompassing kind of dark Disney, for lack of a better term, you know, but not maybe Disney's the wrong, definitely the wrong, uh, just an all encompassing dark minded uh, collective. Right. That's that's what I'd like it to be. And and. Um, you know, hopefully I can, I can, we can, we can achieve that. You know, um, it's, it's going to take a lot of work and, and we're doing, I think we're doing the right things. I think I've hired some of the right people so far. Um, it's very much baby steps at this point. And, uh, you know, once we get rolling on stuff and we have some content, like with this movie, I just shot the short film, 
Uh, there's a lot of BTS stuff that we have behind the scenes stuff that that's going to be on the website. And I think it's pretty interesting. You know, it kind of delves into how we made the movie and some of the effect stuff that we've done and, and things like that. So it, it kind of, you know, it's all practical, no, no CG. Um, like I said, it's shot on film. So um, it'll be a kind of the behind the scenes stuff will be a window in, into that kind of, kind of world, um, which I, I think is pretty interesting. Um, and then, you know, I don't know where it's going to go from there. I, I, I'm playing with AI stuff, and and it's it's interesting, but you know, I, I use it more as a production uh, kind of thing to to get just ideas out of my head quickly. It's really good at that. Um, you know, I, I use a program called Mid Journey, where I can just oh, what what does this scary scene in my head look like, or what does this scary scene in my head look like, and blah blah blah. And then if I like something, I'll actually go out and hire an artist and say, hey, here's some ideas. Look at all this mid journey crap. Um, what what can you do with this stuff? Let's 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 work on this idea. Um, I had actually storyboarded some of the some of the um, some of the short film that I did with with some of that mid journey stuff, and I had an artist kind of use that as inspiration to go through some of the camera angles and the, the set designs and just kind of uh, you know storyboard that stuff out. And it was very helpful. It kind of got him on the same page as, as what I was thinking right away. So um, I think you know there's all this kind of uh, alarm about AI replacing people and things like that. I don't know. I mean, people are really good at what they do. Um, so I, I, I see it as a, a helping hand. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm just jaded by all the technology that I've worked with. I'm, I'm a tinkerer by nature, right? So everything that comes out, I tinker with every program, every app, every this, every that, I touch it, I, I mess with it. And if it's visual, right. And, and the AI is just the next thing for me. That's visual that, that allows me to get this crazy brain to download imagery very quickly, you know? Um, so that's, that's exciting for me. Um, and yeah, yeah I, feel, I feel the same way about AI. I mean, yeah. you know, we, um, you know, we talk about that and, and it's a tool, you know, there's a lot of people that are scared of it or, you know, mm -hmm. think it's, it's going to take us over, uh, uh, you know, AKA the Terminator. Um, but, um, ultimately it's going to be a tool that's going to help us make better art, uh, write better, um, do, do a lot of things better. At least that's my, you know, positive hope for it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. So, well, um, Unfortunately, uh, that's all the time that we have for today. If you have any questions about any of the topics that we talked about, drop them into the comments and I will try to answer them um, without providing any real legal advice, of course. Keep in mind that this series is intended to be a very general discussion of legal issues in the video game industry. It is not intended as actual legal advice. If you need actual legal advice, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you. I want to thank Chris Perna for coming on today and talking about his amazing 20 plus years in the video game industry and everything he's working on now. Chris, thank you. Thank you, Darius. That was great. That was really fun. Thanks. I'm your host, Darius Gambino, and we will see you next time on Lawyers with Game.